A reaction coordinate diagram, or RC diagram, is just a way of displaying the difference in energy between the products and reactants, and also showing the, uh, the energy of the transition state. So you've seen these before. We have energy on one axis, and we've got a reaction coordinate on the other. We have a reactant, transition state, and product. And so we might have A going to B, and up here we have a transition state. We should always, anything to do with the transition state, we always denote with a double dagger. So the one thing that probably is unclear at this point is what the reaction coordinate is. Now a reaction coordinate, it can be as simple, uh, as, simple as, uh, as a one-dimensional motion. So if you have a nucleophile, you've got that pair of electrons coming in. You've got your electrophile here. With a leaving group, and we know this is going to come in and this is going to come out, or if this is an SN2 reaction. So it looks like all the motion is on the x coordinate and it's all just a linear motion, but that's not actually true. Remember that, that these groups were pointing back away from this and that they have to do a, a, an inversion, right? We get inversion with the SN2 reaction. They both move back to this side because now we're going to have the nucleophile on this side. So there's more than one type of motion along the reaction coordinate. So a reaction coordinate encompasses all the movements that have to happen to get the geometry to go from reactants to products. And so those can include uh, bond rotations, bond stretching, bond compression, torsional angle changing. So the reaction coordinate just means that we're moving the geometry more towards products. So it can be a combination of more than one coordinate. Another thing we can point out in this diagram is that if we look at this distance, this would be the activation energy for the forward reaction. And this distance would be the activation energy for the back reaction. And so we can sort of get a picture of what the sizes of K1 and K1 prime would be just by looking at an RC diagram. And so they're kind of handy uh, for looking at things like uh, if we had a if we had a, a, a parallel reaction, we could draw that on a reaction coordinate. Now in this case, the reaction coordinate would be kind of bidirectional, right? You'd have, if we're going from reactant to product A or product B by two parallel, by two uh, competing reactions here, by looking at the at the uh, difference between these, we can see what the equilibrium constant for the R versus A reaction would be because these are energies of R and energy of, of the product A. We can see the equilibrium constant for these two things by looking at this energy difference. And of course, by looking at the sizes of these two different transition states. So we have a transition state for the R to B reaction. We could have a different transition state for the R to A reaction. So we can see which of these is going to have a bigger rate constant. Now in this case, it looks like the forward rate constant for the two parallel competing reactions are about the same. So under kinetic control, we'd expect to see equal amounts of A and B being formed from that reactant. On the other hand, if the temperature is great enough that we get significant back reaction, in other words, if thermal energy is comparable to this back reaction activation energy, we could get back reaction here. If we get a high enough thermal energy, we get back reaction here. The whole thing would be in equilibrium, all the way from B to A. And in that case, we know that we would end up with more B because B is lower in energy than A. So at equilibrium, we'd expect to have hardly any R, quite a bit of A, and predominantly B. So all those things can be seen on a reaction coordinate diagram. There's one more thing about reaction coordinate diagrams that you may have learned in organic, but I'd like to review, and that's the idea of early and late transition states. And this is a rule of thumb, but it's quite handy. And that says if we have a reactant and product, and the energy of the transition state is going to be closer to the higher energy thing, right? So it's going to be the, the transition state's closer in energy to 
A than it is to B for this particular reaction. And the rule of thumb is that if the it's closer in energy, it's also closer along the RC axis as well. So instead of drawing the transition state over here, I'll draw it over here. So I'd be called an early transition state. On the other hand, if I had a reaction with an unfavorable equilibrium constant, we can see that this time the transition state is going to be closer in energy to B than it is to A, and so it's also closer in structure. So we'll, so we'll draw our transition state over here. So that would be a late transition state. So the rule of thumb there is that your transition state is closer on the RC axis to the things that it's closer on the energy axis. That's a little bit handy if we want to come up with a sort of geometrical model of what a transition state looks like. We know it's a hybrid between the reactant and the product, but in these two cases, in the left case over here, we could say it's, 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 it's intermediate between these two, but it's closer in structure to reactant. And over here, we'd say it's intermediate in property between A and B, but it's closer in structure to B. So it allows us to get a better picture of uh, the structure of the transition state.